Ezra chapter 4. Ezra chapter 4. I mentioned this a little bit in the last week's message as we were talking about um, these enemies that rised up. We're talking about who's for us, who's against us. Obviously, they had some uh, adversaries as they're building this temple and uh, build, trying to get things back. God leads them, lets, allows them to go back into the land. Uh, even King Cyrus gives them that decree and helps to provide for them. But some time's gone by now, and they're there, they're working, and these adversaries come that it talks about, and they say, hey, we are, we worship the same God you do, and we want to sacrifice and do all that. And Zerubbabel says, no, you know, we're going to do it ourselves. We don't need your help. And then ultimately they show their true colors and end up being a huge uh, burden on them as far as trying to stop them from doing the work. And in the process, they bring up these accusations about them, and that's what the message is about tonight. Let's go ahead and stand. I'll just read three verses. <clears throat> Maybe a little bit more than that. Let's start with verse. Uh, let's start with verse eleven. This is the copy of the letter that was sent unto him, even to Artaxerxes the king. Thy servants, the men on this side the river, and at such a time, be it known unto the king that the Jews which came up from thee to us are coming to Jerusalem, building the rebellious and the bad city, and have set up the walls thereof, and joined the foundations. Be it known now unto the king that if this city be builded, and the walls set up again, then will they not pay toll, tribute, or and custom. And so thou shalt endamage the revenue of the kings. Now because we have maintenance from the king's palace, and it was not meet for us to see the king's dishonor, therefore have we sent the, uh, and certified the king. <clears throat> that search may be made in the book of the records of thy fathers, so shalt thou find in the book of the records and know that this city is a rebellious city and hurtful unto the king and, prov and provinces, and that they have moved sedition within the same of old time, for which cause was this city destroyed. We certify the king that if this city be built again, and the walls thereof set up, by this means thou shalt have no portion on this side the river. All right, you can be seated. And the title of the message tonight is Accusations Brought Against God's People. Accusations Brought Against God's People. Now remember, these, these are God's people. Sometimes we start talking kind of bad, start talking bad about Jews because of the fact that so many of them are like falling into idolatry and they're, they're making all these bad mistakes and they're going after, in some cases, even parts of them going after other gods. And then that continues on to when Christ comes, we know that the Pharisees are going to be involved. And then in the book of Acts, uh, the Jews are the ones persecuting the church. And so you get this idea sometimes that the Jews are bad. But the case is in the Old Testament, when you talk about the Jews, those are God's people. Those are the people who, uh, who are the nation God has protected, God has you know, blessed. Obviously, the ones that are bad and the ones that don't have the faith, they don't. Uh, he's not really their God in their heart. Like uh, some of those guys he destroys and, uh, well, I mean, even destroys in some cases multitudes of people that includes the innocent people who probably are the godly uh, seed. But uh, ultimately you got, you know, Israel and then you got those who are Israel indeed. Okay, as Paul says, those who are true believers and following the Lord. And that's the people we're talking about. So we can always make application to God's people in the New Testament by reading about the Jews in the Old Testament. And it's not that it, I, it lines up exactly the same, but we're still talking about God's people. And children of God today are believers in Jesus Christ, put their faith and trust in Him, and uh, we are God's people. And the Bible makes that clear that, that, is, that that's just how that works. We are part of God's people that He's had from the beginning 
You know, that doesn't make us Jews. I mean, in fact, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call myself a Jew because I don't believe in the, in the religion of the Jews today, Judaism. But it does make us Jews in the sense of God being God's people and being that promised, uh, that promised seed because of Jesus, we've received Jesus Christ. He's the promised seed, by the way. Now, why did I say all that? Okay, because we see that every time the children of God are do, in the Old Testament are doing some kind of work, there are always people who come and they're their adversaries or their enemies, and they rise up against them and they try to stop them from doing the work that God had called them to do or God had allowed them to do. You know, and there's sometimes there's somebody that God sent there to challenge them and try them. Sometimes they're, you know, just wicked people who come and try to do this. Uh, whatever the case, we see over and over again in the Bible that the Jews who are serving God and trying to do right, they're met off, often with opposition and met with uh, adversaries. Now, this shouldn't be a surprise to us even in the New Testament. I'm going to come back. You know, don't lose your place in Ezra. I'm going to go ahead and mark it now. Don't lose your place in Ezra, but go over. We're going to look at some verses in the New Testament that tell us that as believers, as Christians following Christ, we should expect that there's going to be persecution, there's going to be tribulation, there's going to be all these trials that are going to come our way. Okay, so let's look at a few verses. Matthew chapter 5 to start with. Matthew chapter 5 and go to verse 11. He says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Okay, so it shouldn't be a surprise. In the Old Testament, men of God were being persecuted. When Jesus comes, Jesus is persecuted. And so naturally, when we proclaim Christ, we're going to be persecuted to some degree. They're going to revile us, say all manner of evil against us, and, uh, and we, that's just something that we need to expect, but Jesus says, go ahead and rejoice about it, because great is your reward in heaven. If you're, if you're getting persecuted because you're legitimately, truly serving God and want to do right, and therefore someone's persecuting you and saying, making stuff up and making accusations about you or whatever, you know what? Just rejoice, because you're doing the right thing, and God knows, and he's going to reward you. Look at Acts chapter 5. This is how the apostles, you know, after Christ rose again, rose up into heaven, and he left the, uh, the church there to, to spread the gospel and to preach. You know, they, they were filled with the Spirit. And these words that Jesus said about rejoicing and, and suffering is something that they obviously took to heart. Acts chapter 5, look at verse 41. After all this persecution that they're going through, <clears throat> it says, And they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing, that they were count, counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Now, this is right after they've been beaten and threatened and, and, and all these manner of accusations were brought up against them, and they go away praising the Lord and rejoicing. Now, most Christians, although we might even say, you know, oh, yeah, I would never reject the Lord, I would never say anything against Him, I would live, up, live for Him up to the very death, you know. A lot of times Christians, when we get just a lot, littlest bit of persecution in our lives, start resisting that and start feeling like, man, I don't want to go through that in my life. And, and you know, someone doesn't want to hang out with you because you're too Christian, you're too godly, you don't do the things that they do or whatever, Compro compromises are sometimes made and and Christians will just start they'll just stop talking about Jesus or something like that because they don't want to be ostracized. Hey, Jesus says, go ahead and let them persecute you. Now, obviously, you love them and show them the gospel and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, if you're persecuted and they say bad things about you and they conspire against you, know that you're in good company. The prophets were that way. Jesus was that way. The apostles were that way. And it all comes down to the fact that that's what serving the Lord is all about because people reject the Lord and they want to go against him. It's all about his adversary, the devil, who's rising up people against him and what have you. All right, go to Acts chapter 14. You're already in chapter
chapter 5. Acts chapter 14, look at verse 22. Or actually, we have to back up a little bit on this. Uh, Let's see here. So, Paul and uh, some of his uh, crew here are going through these towns. It says in verse 20, Howbeit as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came to the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned unto Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And then they ordained them elders and they prayed and all that. Okay, So some people would read that and get mixed up and say, like, see, the only way you're going to go to heaven is if you go through these tribulation, and the only way you're going to go to heaven is if you continue in the faith. Uh, And that's not what he's doing here. He's going back to those people who were saved, and he's saying, okay, now I'm going to really challenge them and push them to be disciples and push them to live for the Lord. It doesn't mean that if they don't, that they're not saved, but it's saying that he is exhorting them and saying, you know, if you're going to live for the Lord between now and the time you enter into the kingdom of heaven, it's going to be met with much trial and tribulation. And it was. You know, history shows. Keep reading in the book of Acts. You'll see it. Keep reading church history for the first uh, couple centuries, and you'll see it, and it's still true today. All right, look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. We're going to come back to Timothy here in just a minute, if I remember right. So you might mark your place in Timothy as well. I got Ezra marked, and now I got Timothy marked. 2 Timothy. All right, 2 Timothy 3, verse 10 says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine. Uh, you know, this is talking about wicked men. Well, I'll, talk, I'll, I'll come back to this passage in a minute. And he said, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's it's almost like, now I don't want to get you the wrong idea here, but it's almost like a litmus test. Like if you're not suffering any persecution, are you even doing anything for the Lord? (laughs) Now I'm not saying that, hey, you need to go out there and try to work up some trouble so that people will persecute you. That's not persecution. But if you're living for the Lord, just mark it down. The Bible says over time and time again, you will suffer persecution. There's people that aren't going to like you because you're serving the Lord, and you're a little too religious for them. You're a little too much like, uh, like Christ, and they don't, li- they don't like Christ, okay? And that's what it comes down to. <clears throat> so in this story uh, in Ezra, and like I said, we're coming right back to uh, Tim- 2 Timothy in a minute, but first go back to Ezra chapter 4. And in this story, these accusations are brought up against them. And all they're trying to do is serve the Lord and build the temple and do what they're supposed to do. We're going to see Ezra and Nehemiah. There's some great things that happen during this time. Uh, But then there are a lot of hindrances to the work being done, and it does prolong them for a long time. But uh, look at verse 12. So Ezra chapter 4, verse 12. Here's uh, one of the accusations that says, Be it known unto the king that the Jews which came up from thee to us are coming to Jerusalem, uh, building the rebellious and the bad city, and have set up the walls thereof and joined the foundations. First point I want to show you, these are the accusations brought up against God's people, still true today, type of accusations you can expect to have. One, people will say that Christians are bad and rebellious. Okay, You're going to hear that. Now, I want to be very careful to distinguish between what I say Christian and right-wing Republican, (laughs) okay? Because a lot of people, whenever I say Christian, or a lot of people in the world, when you say Christian, they're thinking right-wing Republican. And sometimes even whenever I'm preaching, it's like, well, if you stand for this, and what I'm thinking are some of the things in our society that are going on where right-wing Republicans are standing for this, no, I'm not talking about all those things. However, if you're a Christian, you're probably going to be against abortion. You're probably going to stand up against the LGBT and the, all the weird stuff that's going on, and you're probably going to 
uh, you know, have more conservative views and probably fall more on that side of the right wing conservatives. But living for Christ, do you know what? It's probably going to bring you persecution from the left side and the right side. <laughs> okay. Republicans, look, they're, they're not necessarily just because the Republicans all gung ho about following the Bible and doing everything that, you know, that Christ tells us to do. Okay, so, so don't make it about, well, you know, at least we're not the left wing, and so therefore, you know, we're true to our camp, and any persecution that our camp gets is because we're Christians. That's not necessarily true, okay? So I want to make sure that I make that distinction uh, really quickly, but so, so the reason I said that is because sometimes the accusation is, you know, well, those right wing Republicans, like they're so rebellious, and they're just bad people, and they're gun carrying, want to kill people, and they do all those kinds of things. Like, we'll bring up gun, uh, the liberty and freedoms to have guns on another day. But sometimes what the left says about the wicked right wing Republicans isn't necessarily something that applies to us as being Christians, okay? But the accusation is out there that Christians, I'm talking about. You know, because, okay, so let me give you an example. The right-wing uh, platform, the right-wing agenda, obviously they're going to speak out against some of the bizarre things that are happening. They might be totally against transgender movement and, and indoctrinating kids and all that stuff. But if you listen to them, here's what they'll say, ultimately. They'll say, look, I don't care if you're an adult and you want to do it. That's your own choice. That's your own freedom, you know, as long as you don't indoctrinate the children or something like that. You know, and they'll say, like, you know, I am, I mean, you know, Trump himself and other guys, like, they'll say, like, I am not against people having the right to be homosexual or, or whatever. And they'll say things that are pretty much appeasing, you know, well, it doesn't matter. The left isn't going to like that either. But, uh, but what I'm getting at is if a Christian actually starts speaking what the Word of God says, and like, hey, I mean, like, I preached, I've been preaching on masculinity and men not being effeminate and all that stuff. And in the course of doing so, I have hit on some things that, you know, some hardcore right-wing Republican could listen to that message and say, this guy, I mean, what, he is, you know, he's crazy. He, he, you know, he believes that men have to do this and women shouldn't wear this and whatever. And ultimately, here's what I'm saying. It's not about picking a side and lining up with a certain group in our society. It's about following Christ, and I guarantee you, you're going to get the persecution on all sides, and all sides are going to say, you know what, them radical Christians, they're bad and they're rebellious. Okay, look at Isaiah, 5, uh, Isaiah 5.20. Still going back to 2 Timothy, but not yet. Isaiah 5. Verse 20, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil and put darkness for light and light for dark. Now, you know, and I know that our society, this, this describes our society today, but it's nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun. This has always been the case. There have always been people that will call that which is good. They'll call it evil and they'll call that which is evil. They'll call it good. And so we, we can expect to see that all around us. And just by being a Christian and just standing up for what the Bible says and trying to do right and trying to follow Christ uh, with our, and, and lead our families to follow Christ, we're going to get accusations from people that said, hey, they are just bad and they're rebellious. When actually what we're trying to do is right and godly and we're trying to do it for the Lord. We're not doing it to be, uh, you know, to, to, for a bad mo with a bad motivation. <clears throat> I brought this verse up. I, I, this verse, uh, to me, in June, when people start flying the rainbow flag and having gay pride parades and stuff like that, this verse always jumps out in my mind. It's Malachi 3, 5, and it says, And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. And it's like you look around, it's like, why aren't these people, why are they continuing to thrive? Why are all these companies like flying rainbow flags? And why are they, and again, again, this isn't about picking sides, you know, the rainbow crowd versus the non-rainbow crowd. This is about following Christ, and Christ makes it very clear, the Bible makes it very clear, 
how he feels against this, uh, this sin, okay? So in June, when all these guys are taking that rainbow, which is something that, you know, we hail and, and Christians have historically uh, taken up the rainbow. There's some, I don't remember who it was, but one of the uh, reform, reformers uh, during the Reformation his sign was uh, a rainbow, and I can't remember who that was, but his, his, you know, he had a flag that identified his, his group of people, and it had a rainbow on it, okay? And so rainbows are, are something that God gave, a beautiful thing. We read about it in, in Genesis after the flood. But obviously, they're picking this up, and they're running with that and saying, uh, you know, that this is a good thing, and, 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 and these people are so happy, and they're so kind and gentle, and they would never hurt anybody which is exactly the opposite of what the Bible says, by the way. And it says, and here it says, we call the proud happy. These, these people that are having their gay pride, guess what gay means? Happy, <laughs> right? And they're, they're having a pride month. Well, this should, shouldn't be a surprise because in the Bible we see that this is the, what society ends up doing and uh, the wicked are even delivered. Okay, now I'll go back to 2 Timothy 3. Now, I already started reading in verse 10, uh, but let's read some little background. Here's what he says. He, you know, he talks about all that live godly will suffer persecution. Well, here's what he says in, ver in verse 1, 2 Timothy chapter 3. This know also that in the last days, now, they were technically, you could say, in the last days, I believe, because, you know, everything after Christ is kind of like considered the last days, but... <clears throat> Here's what he said. He's talking about perilous times shall come, which means, you know, other generations are going to be even worse. Now, we're looking at our generation now, and I can try to compare our generation and the amount of persecution we're getting in the United States, try to compare that to what the Apostle Paul was going through and what people did in the Roman Empire, and it doesn't even compare. Like, we have plenty of liberty and freedom, and we don't have the type of persecution that they had. But guess what? It's coming. It's coming. We might not be at this part yet that he's talking about. Genera I mean, different groups of people throughout history have gone through this stuff, uh, but we ourselves might not be there yet, but the time is coming. Uh, Perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead ca captive silly women laden with sin, sins, led away with, cert with, with uh, diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also, theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine. That's where he goes into that part. Okay, so I don't know about you, but every time I read this, every time I've heard a preacher read this for the majority of my life, I've said, huh. That could apply to our society today. Like, you know, all these disobedient parents and without natural affection. I mean, you can go through that and apply it to our generation. I would say you can apply that to every generation, probably since the time this was written. And I think there's a generation coming that we're really close to, in my estimation, that is really going to apply to this because it's the generation he's talking about where you can expect to have all kinds of persecution brought against God's people. The world likes to talk about Christians and accuse us of being rebellious against the laws of the land, right? Uh, they say, hey, you, you Christians, you believe in creation. You deny science. Of course, we would say, according to the Bible, uh, that is what is known as science falsely so-called. What they claim to be science, in many cases, is not Science. I mean, homosexuality is one <laughs> of them. You know, how is that scientific? How is there anything scientific about that? That a boy can have a girl gender or a girl can have a boy's gender. 
uh, is not science. Okay? That the world just came into being from nothing. That's not science. Now, scientists will say, well, that's not exactly what we believe. But in, in, in a sense, it is. Uh, they will deny, and this, Peter talked about this, how many are going to deny uh, you know, that the God created the, the world and, that, and, and I believe there's an inference in there about the flood. You know, that they're going to deny that. Well, I just read from a friend of ours. He came here a long time ago. Uh, I don't know if you remember, um, Brother uh, Matt, uh, Matt Powell. He just put out a video recently, and he was talking about how there are people who believe, they, they deny the flood. They laugh at us for saying that, you know, Noah was in an ark. It rained 40 days and 40 nights. They say, oh, that's so ridiculous. But, you know, they're actually, they believe that there was a time period for 2 million years where it continued to rain on the earth. For 2 million years. I was like, I've never heard of that. And so I Googled it. Yeah, that's like a, a something that they just all agree upon. Hey, there was obviously this time, and it took that much time for all the, you know, the earth is like during the time of what they called Pangea. In order to get the world, the world to separate and all that, there had to be all this water and what have you. And so, therefore, you know, it, it lasted like two million years of just this constant water. I didn't really read all of the, I didn't study it that much because I deny science, I guess. But anyway, uh, uh, you know, we're accused of being rebellious against the, the experts, the expert scientists and the expert psychi psychiatrists in social science of the day and and all this stuff, like I'm telling you, look, you're not, look, there are people that educate themselves and they're very smart in an emergency. I don't know who to go to. I will go to doctors and all that stuff. But I'm telling you that they are not experts in the sense of, you know, they're not these, these wonderful people who have all the answers. Okay, It's not really any different than it has been for 500 years or whatever of our nation practicing with medicine and trying to figure things out. They don't have all the answers. We don't either. We got to trust them to some degree. Uh, but when the Bible, when, when we start denying something, say like, that doesn't seem to jive with what the Bible says. And they say, well, you're just a rebel. You're just denying what uh, the scientists say, the smart people of our society. You're just re rebellious and you're bad. And you, you know, you go against the laws of the land. The land says, hey, it's okay to commit abortion. And here you are fighting people on that. It's okay, oh, you, you got to accept uh, homosexuality and all this, and here you are going against the laws of the land, and, and uh, you know, you got a problem with adultery, and you got a problem with all these sins and fornication and all that stuff. Hey, my Bible tells me, your Bible too, by the way, tells me that, th that John the Baptist got his head cut off for telling a king that he shouldn't be married to, to his, his brother's wife, okay? Then uh, there's a lot of reasons why he shouldn't have been married to her, but all he said is that you shouldn't be married to that person. Now, can, you know, who, which political leader or Hollywood star or any famous person in this world, you know, it's very low amount of people that you can't go to them and say like, hey, the Bible says you shouldn't have this person as your wife, or you shouldn't be messing around with this person who's not your wife. Or whatever the case, but you know what? If a preacher or a Christian gets up and confronts somebody and tells them, hey, the Bible says you shouldn't do this, what are they going to look at? They're going to say, hey, that person, we need to escort them. We need to put them in cuffs and take them away because they are bad people and they're rebellious people. It shouldn't be a surprise. That's what they did with the apostles, and they put them in jail. And they just sang praises and said, well, we're thankful that you know God will allow us to, to go through this, and he's going to reward us for it one day. <clears throat> Number two, look at verse 13. Ezra, Ezra chapter 4, verse 13. Here's another accusation. The next two are going to be a lot shorter. <clears throat> be it known now unto the king that if this city be builded and the wall set up again, then will they not pay toll, tribute, or custom, and so they shall endamage the revenue of the king's. You know, an accusation that Christians get a lot of times is that, hey, they're not gonna, they don't pay taxes. They're not going to pay, you know, all the things that they're, you know, and, and Christians will say like, well, I don't want to have to pay taxes that are going to abortions, or I don't want to give my money to this or that, or, or I don't want, you know, and, and there's certain things that we will say, we'll kind of protest under our breath or, or in a message or whatever. 
Um, and, and they will say, like, oh, you got to watch. You see, what they're really doing is they're trying to get away. They're trying to get out of paying taxes. Now, if I understand right, the, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but I, I think whenever I was studying the Amish, like, they actually have an exemption where they don't have to pay taxes or something. Maybe, maybe it's not taxes. I can't remember. But they have some kind of exemptions on that. But here's the thing. There are churches and there are people in ministry who use that as a front to be able to get out of paying taxes. It goes on. There's wicked people who call themselves Christians and they go do things. But there are entire church buildings like, hey, the church of blah, 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 that's just a front. It really isn't anything except for a way to, for these guys to get out of paying taxes. That, goes, that literally goes on. But it's very few and far between compared to how many churches there are out here just trying to serve the Lord. But the accusation will get, and I remember one time having a phone call. You know, there's, I went through a period where I was getting all kinds of phone calls of people who I don't know if they heard a message or they just kind of tied me in with some other independent fundamental Baptist preachers or whatever. But they would call me and start saying, hey, we're going to get you shut down. And, and once the people know what you're doing, they're going to take away your tax exemption status, and we're going to do this and that. And and you're not even operating right. You shouldn't be tax exempt and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I don't even know much about taxes. And I don't really even care about the exemption status necessarily. As long as I have it, because we're a church, I'm going to use it. But this is actually a huge accusation that the world makes about Christians. The, 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 I should say like the atheists and the people who, who reject religion. Uh, they will say like, hey, these Christians, quote unquote, are actually these wicked people and they're just trying to get out of paying taxes and they're not, you know. Now, there are lots of politicians that are getting out of paying taxes. There are a lot of rich, like wealthy entrepreneurs that are getting out of paying taxes and all this stuff, but who are they going to point their fingers at? Those Christians. Uh, I don't know how much you know about Kent Hovind. I don't even know a whole lot about the story. But, man, he did, like, 11 years or something like that in prison. In prison, I know I, I heard that they were trying to give him 20 years because the way he set up his ministry, he was paying people, and somehow because it was ministry related, he thought he didn't have to pay taxes or he just refused to pay taxes or whatever it was. And they locked him away for like 11 years. Why? Well, everything I read about it, the people that were lobbying and pushing really hard to get him more jail time and say, hey, don't let him go. and and let's all sign this uh, petition or whatever. They all hated God, and they're like, here's this radical, independent, fundamental Baptist, and look what happens. Like, they try to get out of paying taxes and all that stuff. Look, it's, it's an accusation that's out there. So it fits right in as we watch these adversaries uh, in Ezra's day try to accuse these guys, hey, they're not going to pay taxes, and they're going to uh, just try to, uh, rob you, and they, they don't want to give the government anything. But hey, we know that that's not biblical. You know, I don't avoid paying taxes. I mean, I've kind of put it off and proc procrastinate, and <laughs> if I could get away with paying less, I probably would. Uh, but you know what? I'm not going to cause a scene or, or, or uh, rise up in some kind of revolt against the government. Let's look at two passages here. Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. So all these people that act like Christianity is something to be afraid of because it's this bad, like, boogeyman who, you know, Christians have always tried to destroy the world and keep the people down and look at all these wars and the bloodshed that was done in the name of Christianity. Look, there's a lot I could say about that as it relates to Catholicism and Protestantism. But that's the accusation. And yet Jesus says this, Matthew chapter 2, verse 21. This is the one that we're following. And he says, he wrote, uh, no, that's not right. Matthew 2, verse 21. Uh, maybe it wasn't 2. I kind of jotted that down at the last minute. I was just going to make mention of it, but... Um, Yeah, I don't know what I did wrong, but it's where he says, uh, they're, they're accusing him about paying taxes, and he's like, hey, bring me a coin. You know, and he says, uh, whose inscription is on there? And they say Caesar's. 
So he's like, you know, give to Caesar that which is Caesar's and give unto God that which is God's. Okay, so go to, uh, you're already in Matthew chapter 2. Let's go to chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17, verse 27. Now, actually, you know, start, go back to 24. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your, past, your master pay tribute? He said, Yes. And when he was coming to the house, uh, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith unto him, Of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, then are the children free, notwithstanding, let, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea, and cast an hook, and take out the fish that first cometh up, and when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money, and take and give unto them for me and for thee. So these guys came and they're like, hey, I think it's time for you to pay some, some, some tribute. You know, I don't know what their, exactly how they paid taxes in that day. How, exactly how that worked, but uh, time for him to pay tribute. And, and, and Peter's like, well, yeah, we, we pay taxes. We pay tribute. It's a little different than taxes. but And he says, uh, uh, and, and so Jesus actually kind of in, insinuates like, hey, you know, God owns all this anyway. You know, it's kind of like whenever I go fishing and you got to pay fishing license and you're just like, uh, you know, what is this, the king's fish? You know what I mean? Like God owns all this. I should be able to fish wherever I want to fish. But you know what? I'm going to get a fishing license because, number one, I don't want to have to pay a $200 ticket. And number two, because that's the law of the land. And why, even though I might be able to make the argument, I can do whatever I want. God's my king. I live in this world. And God's told me not to be that kind of a person and to just go ahead and comply whenever it's not a, a major issue. And when it comes to paying taxes, that's what he says to do. Jesus says to do that. And then finally, they say, he says this, go back to Ezra chapter 4, verse 15. And he says, go check your book. And he, and he says, and ser that search may be made in the book of the records of thy father. So shalt thou find in the book of the records and know that this city is a rebellious city and hurtful unto kings and provinces and that they have moved sedition within the same of old time for which cause was this city destroyed. So basically what he's saying is, hey, here's the accusation. They are going to rise up against us. You know, we have to keep them down. Otherwise, they're going to rise up against us. And they say, hey, go back and look throughout history, and you'll see this is the case. Okay. <clears throat> now, we live in a society now that, again, ultimately those who are really following, and I don't want to just say independent fundamental Baptist, but that's just typically what I go with because that's what I am. Uh, but there are those who are considered by the world very radical, people who actually believe the Bible and actually want to do what the Bible says. And it doesn't, they don't sit very well in this world. And so what the, even the FBI, and you could talk to people who are actually knowledgeable about what's in the FBI, there have been groups of people on the FBI watch list who are independent fundamental Baptists. And so therefore... There's this idea that all these fundamentalists, these radicals, like we got to watch them because they're conspiring to take over the government and they're going to, they're trying to rule and they've got all the guns and they've got all this stuff. And so there's these accusations all the time made about that. And I'm not too worried about it, but, uh, but it is, it does kind of bother me whenever I see, like, if you watch a movie or a show, oftentimes if there's religion involved and there's like a villain in the, in the movie, but he's a religious person, a lot of times they're like this fundamentalist, which the world doesn't completely understand fundamental Christianity, so they all, it's always like this weird cult leader, but ultimately the world's seeing them as, a, as a, a dedicated Christian, right? A dedicated one, not one that just calls themselves, you know, they, they, they're just humanists, but they call themselves Christians. But no, this hardcore, uh, you know, cult, which by the way, they call us in independent fundamental Baptist cults all the time, all the time. Okay, and I'm saying they as in the world. Okay, so, you know, there was this video game a while back. Now, I don't know whatever came of it. I think it got enough, 
I think enough people got upset about it that maybe they, they took, I, I don't, I, I didn't really ever check back and research it. But at the time I saw this advertised or I saw someone talking about it, and basically what it is a shooter game, which I'm, I'm, I'm against a lot of those, like the way that they're set up and the way that they, you know, portray it, regardless of what the media says, and everyone wants to say, like, there's no evidence that these people that play video games, that it's causing them to, to want to go out and shoot people, even though there's lots of situations where the people that went out and did these mass killings were, they played those video games all the time. I say, no, no, the relationship isn't there. The relationship is they had this particular mental illness that wasn't de dealt with, and that people with that mental illness shouldn't be playing those video games, but everybody else can. And so, <laughs> anyway, so one of these shooter video games, I believe that you're kind of working for the law enforcement, if I understand right. But I remember the main thing about it was that they were going and they were killing these people who were part of this cult. And these cult were, they, these were the bad guys, okay? And, uh, and, and ladies got the long skirts on and the men are dressed a certain way and there's like these radical cult leaders who have guns or whatever. I don't even know if they did have guns. And hey, they devised some kind of story where these guys are going to, you know, hurt us and so therefore we have to, we have to kill them. And I remember just thinking like, hey, this is just another step. And then the shows and the movies out there that show, hey, some radical fundamentalist you know, is this bad guy who's abusing people and keeping children in their basement or whatever weird things that they say about them. Hey, I'm, there are wicked people all over the world that might claim to be independent fundamental Baptists or, or Christians or, or whatever. I'm not talking, I mean, I realize that. But the world would love the, 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 one, the part of the world that hates, hates the Bible and hates Jesus. You know, they would love to paint the picture that people who are dedicated for the Lord are these wicked people who are going to commit sedition and try to overthrow the government or something like that. And so it shouldn't be a surprise that they, they're accusing uh, God's people of having done that. And go back and check the history. By the way, that's what they'll say a lot of times, and I think I kind of alluded to this already, but go back and check the history books. You'll find that all the wars were fought, the early wars were fought in the name of religion and, and all this kind of stuff. And so the world would like to paint Christians as being these wicked villains. <clears throat> now. I, I believe, and I'm not going to get into this tonight, but I, I believe that when you get to Revelation 13, it talks about receiving the mark of the beast, and you can't buy, sell, trade unless you have the mark. I believe that that is where all this is heading. You know, we, we might not see it now. It might sound a little crazy, but I do believe that the time is coming where God's people will be moved to a point, because you know, the Bible says that he waged war against the saints. And, uh, and those people who are believers are up until that, up until the rapture, don't get me wrong, the, I, I totally believe the rapture is coming and we're going to be saved out of tribulation. We're going to be, uh, those who endure to the end are enduring to the point where Jesus comes, okay? And so the, on, I obviously believe that's going to happen. But in those last days before he comes, it's going to be rough. Christians are going to be persecuted to the point of, nope, you're not going to be able to buy, sell, trade unless you will whatever they make you do, renounce the Lord and take this, this, this mark or, or whatever, okay? But the fight is not against us so much. It might look like that, and we might make it us versus them, but the fight's not really against us. The fight and the, the animosity that people have is not towards us, it's towards God. Jesus said that, hey, they hated me, they're going to hate you. And, you know, they hate you because they hate me. When we go soul winning, like it's very rare, usually... The worst that you get, like a bad day where somebody just, you know, hey, everybody rejected me today. Here's what it looks like. No, thank you, not interested. Or did you read this no soliciting sign? Uh, that's about it. That's the extent of the op opposition that we usually will get, okay? But every once in a while, <clears throat> we'll get somebody who will um, start hollering just off the blue, just like, blankety blank blank and you, you you guys did this and this and that and and just start bringing all kinds of weird things about us and we're like hey this person knows nothing about me all they know is i got a bible in my hand i knocked on the door and i said the word church and they just flipped out and they went off they can't be mad at me because they don't even know me they can't be mad at me i didn't step on their flowers or you know ruin something in their yard all i did was knock on their door 
And so we have to remind ourselves as Christians, it's not us that they really hate. It's God that they ultimately hate. Now, we are ambassadors of God, and we are witnesses for him, and we are serving him. So obviously, if you've got a problem with the master, you're going to have a problem with me. If you've got a problem, uh, you know, I'm saying if you don't like him, you're probably not going to like me. But at the same time, hey, you're not going to change me because I'm representing the Father. And so that, therefore, it's going to look like there are enemies and there are adversaries and they're raising all kind of accusations against us. Should be expected, and that's something that we see all throughout the Bible. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the calling that you've given us to serve you. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to uh, endure and be bold and continue uh, to enter into the kingdom through much trial and tribulation, as we know uh, is just kind of a necessity for all those that will follow, be disciples, and, and live for the Lord. I pray that you'll help us do that. Keep in our minds, Lord, help us not forget that when such things come, you're watching and you're ready to reward us and you're pleased and help us not get worried about or scared about the persecution and the accusations and all. And I pray, Lord, that you would protect us, though. Uh, help us to do your work without, uh, if it be your will, help us not to have to have any um, hindrances that would stop us from doing it. And I pray, Lord, both here and in Kansas City and all our missionaries and those who we have uh, uh, contact with, Lord, that you would just keep us um, as long as, as possible, Lord. Just allow us to have peace and the ability to do your work without trial. And, uh, but we also know when it comes, Lord, that it should be expected, and I pray you help us to be strong and get through it. <clears throat> Lord, be blessed this night. Help us as we go our separate ways. Protect us. Keep us safe in Jesus' name. Amen.